Ah, deep breath, everybody out there. Welcome, welcome, welcome. 420 Live, Jeff Kravitz. Monday, June 29th. Here we are once again on the hamster wheel of life, going round and round, wondering if it'll ever stop, if things will change. Will they ever go back to normal? Well, <laughs> I don't know about your normal, but there's a new normal going on out there, folks. Welcome, everybody. I hope you're doing well. I know there's a lot of information being thrown to everybody, everybody's plans being uprooted by what's happening out there in the crazy world. Don't know which way to turn, don't know who to believe. You sit there watching the TV, just shaking your head. Uh, you know, I tend to turn it off more than watch it, but I tune in. I have to spend a little bit of time every day. I give it about 15 minutes. Evening news, if you watch like any of the network evening news, the 15, first 15 minutes is all you really need because after that, it's just 20 minutes of commercial with two 30-second stories. I, I don't even understand why I keep watching it after 6.45 uh, out here. We get it a little bit later, right? Three hours later, but Anyway, it, it's never, it's not good because we don't understand. We can't get the truth. We don't know really what's always happening. Two steps forward, four steps backwards. It seems that's the way our country's going, the way we're opening. Um, you know, it, it's frustrating for a lot of us out there. Uh, you know, uh, people have a certain lifestyle that's been compromised. I saw an article today that said half the U.S. population is out of work. So that's, uh, you know, a lot of people, that's 175, 160 million people that are out of work right now. So um, I'm one of them. And uh, this <laughs> isn't really a job. It's an adventure. Usually I'm a photographer. I've been doing that for the past, uh, since, oh God, I don't even want to say since over 40 years I've been shooting since I was uh, a kid in high school. And uh, now I'm uh, coming to you daily with my little 420 Live webcast where we been introducing you to some of my friends. Last week, we went to Stuart Copeland's house. And, you know, I really, of course, wanted to go in that studio and touch everything in there, but it's a pandemic, you know? So uh, that will happen. And I will take you with me when that does happen. But for now, you know, we hung out in the doorway to a studio. And it's just to be able to talk to somebody face to face compared to doing the web chat is so much more engaging for me, at least. Um, you know, and it makes me think about all these things. Like you think about doing interviews, you need multi cameras and you need the best gear. And, you know, you, it, it's really taking things to the next level. And I'm just trying to do a simple little show where I'm, I'm figuring out stuff. I'm still learning how to work my Instagram account and how to get my YouTube popping. So, uh, you know, we're all educating ourselves. I think a lot of people have picked up the pandemic pivot and uh, it's been important to find somewhere to put your energy, to find something to do every day and to figure out you know, what's going to happen in our world. And while we're figuring that out, to also stay safe. Uh, you know, we see most of the cases now are kids that are younger. And uh, that's what's happening is that the youth are getting sick. But it also seems that the uh, it's just hard to wrap our head around because we don't have the facts and we're not getting the facts. And, you know, everybody's expecting things to change and go back the way they were. And I think that's ultimately what it is. And it really blows my blows me away about how bad people need want to get to a bar to drink. <laughs> I mean, I know it's hard not being social, but, you know, this is such a short, you know, you're like, oh, I haven't had a drink in a bar for three months. Let me run out to a bar and have a drink. And then you're coming back and getting sick. I mean, it, it's not really worth it. And now it's going to be a, lo a little bit longer till we figure it out, because obviously we need to flatten the curve. So uh, if you're like me, you're a you're humongous music fan. It's probably why you're here. It's probably why you're tuning in, because we all love music. And we're all, you know, in an interesting space where we're educating ourselves. If you saw Justice Comes Alive yesterday, those guys, uh, Kunj did a great job of, of uh, having talent talk about social issues and trying to get people to focus on what's happening today and raising $50,000 uh, for uh, plus one, I believe. Uh, so I think... It's great uh, what's happening out there, the money being raised, the attention being focused. But, you know, there's a hole. There's a hole in my head, in my heart, and everywhere where music used to go. And I have these two holes here in the side of my head, and they're really lacking in uh, enjoyment because they bring me a lot of pleasure. And I really need music more than I need a cocktail. <laughs> so 
My guests today are Dean Budnick. If, you, if you're a fish fan, Dean was the first one to put anything in writing that I could go and buy that explained to me what the hell was going on on stage because I was totally mystified and I had, there were so many books about the Grateful Dead out there, but there was only one book out there at the beginning. I bet you it's on my shelf back there too. I could yank it out. Um, and it, it kind of broke down what was going on so you could understand as a new head in the mid nineties, what was happening. Mike Greenhouse has been editor of Relics Magazine, been around the scene for years. I want to introduce you to the guys and bring them in and say, hi, Mike. Hello, Mike. Hello, Dean. Hey. How are you guys? We're doing well. We're doing well. Although, just much like you, missing the power of live these days, unfortunately. It, well, you're, you're bringing it to us, though. You're bringing yeah. us the power of live and the new relics. Why don't you tell us what's ha- what we have to look forward to in the new issue? Sure. Hey, you know, by the way, got it right here. Nice. Right. There you go. Oh. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, the... Um, it's we we have a pretty major feature well that's devoted to a, a number of artists who took some time to sort of talk about the nature of live music, why it's so important to them, where we're headed, and really I thought we're have been pretty generous with with giving us at, at this time when they have a lot going on, just sort of rap about the nature of of live music and its role within society and culture and, and the like, right? Um, Trey, by the way, that piece went up online today people can find it on relics.com uh, and i'll go alphabetically and then I, michael michael kick in no doubt uh, as well we have i'm, I'm reading the i'm reading the cover so it's well, easy wait well, let, let, let's let, let's let, let's take our time because we got we have a quite a bit of time okay. and I, I before we got on the air today i i read the tray piece and as a fish head it's fucking disturbing <laughs> you think so? you think so you think so i think he's talking about one line which is disturbing which is, uh, you know, not to uh, to give away the story, but uh, I, I wouldn't be holding my breath about uh, about Fish doing a webcast, according to your interview, Dean. But yeah. I, I would argue that there's a certain, there's a majesty to that. There's a beauty to it in terms of why he doesn't want to do it and what he feels like he gets out of the, the live experience and the back and forth. I think it's what a lot of people have sort of assumed for a while or had hoped was true in that it's so important to the band to have people right in front of them that if they can't do that he doesn't feel comfortable and i just i think that's marvelous I, I do as a, as a frustrated musician myself i can't wait till my other guys in my band are like come on can we get in the jam room and play i mean it's so frustrating playing alone and that's even in the jam room at least you're getting your yayas out and to me i can't get over that kind of disconnect where it's like i don't want to see the guys i don't want to play you know he doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. I believe he hints at the fact that he, he could imagine recording again, just right. like they recorded before they came back in 2009. All he said was, I don't want to play. I don't want to do a live stream of a show without an audience in front of me, which I, again, I actually. Uh, hey, listen, for, 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 for me, when you're talking Grateful Dead or Fish or any of these jam bands, they all feed off the audience. The audience is important as the band on stage. Yeah. So. And he, and he talks a lot about, you know, that that awesome December 30th tweezer from last year and and just how that moment, you know, everyone in the room influenced that from, I think his, his words were the guy getting a beer or a guy in the bathroom to obviously, you know, their friends and family backstage and the people in the front row. And uh, and of course, you know, the uh, the other guys on stage with him. And Ronnie Delsner. He name checks Ronnie, Ronnie Delsner, Delsner as well. well that, that's pretty good. Yeah. Well, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to be in that little room back there with Ronnie, and it, it's an experience, and they're definitely working some mojo back there. <laughs> the best way I would describe this Trey interview is, you know, for all those people who always said, you know, Trey is a Jedi, this is his most Yoda interview I've read in a long time. You know, it's very, it's very zen. It's very... Thoughtful. Well, you know, the, 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 the thing that resonated me the most yeah. was that Trey remains in New York with all this sadness pouring down his street every day that's affecting his mood and his mindset. You could see it in the article. He keeps touching back on the first responders yeah. and the, the people that are working the things. And I, it just I just don't understand why he doesn't go to the country or you know, to stay in the city and to witness that when there are a lot of people have left the city, let's face it. You know, Mike, are you still in the city? No, I'm, I'm currently quarantined in South Carolina, but I would say that, 
you know, it, one of the most interesting things about working on this this uh, this issue in general is just seeing where everyone has vacated to or stayed, no matter where they're based. Especially musicians who are based in a major city. You know, there's definitely some like Trey have stayed and kind of used the uh, energy or lack thereof to influence their art. And there's a lot of people who are like, okay, I've always wanted to try living somewhere else, or I have family or somewhere a little bit more uh, scenic and pristine. So I'll check that out instead. It just, it just seems to me like anything that you're going to write in that kind of uh, mindset with that kind of death and devastation around you that's affecting you daily in in the way you're thinking is going to be coming out into the music. And I'm like, oh, I'm so, I, I really like uplifting. And, you know, I'm so, when I go to a show, I don't want to kind of relive what we when I finally go to a show. I don't want to have the COVID concert for my first set on, you know, a bunch of depressing songs about where I'm not saying that the songs he's writing depressing. I'm not categorizing any of the music that he's doing. I'm just saying it just seems like you could change your mindset with your location, especially in the East Coast. There's so many places you could drive to, you know, why stay in the city? But, you know, I know he loves one of the he got a lot of love for New York City, but I have a lot of friends that love New York City that have left over the past year that I've been shocked and picked up and moved. And I yeah. see it happening more and more. So it, it's something that is happening. People are having to figure out this new life and this new paradigm and realizing being face to face like that's kind of crazy. But that being said, his his output with 14 songs has been totally inspiring. And obviously, he's got a lot of free time on his hands. Yeah. <laughs> well, OK, Dean, go to B. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, fine. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, although still a little technically it's B-I-E, it's the second, but the second person whose last name begins with an A uh -huh. is Ms. Nicole Atkins. Ah, Nicole Atkins, yes. Who I, I think has some pretty interesting things. Well, she released an album during during all of this, and she talks a little bit about that, tells some stories about growing up in New Jersey and uh, and what that was like and how that sort of informed her own perspective on all of this and then her move to New York and you know walking into some of those open mic nights and how that all came together so she is second uh our b i guess this is a b is mr john batiste who i think really shares a global perspective on the power of live talks about going to haiti and what he experienced there and um you know which is something that i actually did a while back and so we went back and forth a little bit on that and, and what and what that's like. But he certainly has been all over the, the world above and above and beyond that, you know, so social music, as he likes to describe it, and, and all of the elements together that uh, that form what he does nowadays, especially, you know, when they take it outside and they and they, you know, decide to continue it sort of in the in the tradition of uh, of the, you know, the New Orleans jazz funeral. Well, he, uh, he, you know, he's, he's been very active during the protests. Yeah. You know, doing shows, having a piano out in the mid, out in the middle of Brooklyn, and just you know, I was gonna say, he's he's another one who another musician who has also stayed in New York and is kind of using the uh, the current situation and that that energy to to move his art forward. Yeah, he's been very very vocal. It's been amazing to see what he's been doing. Did you talk to him about that stuff too, or was the interview already in the can by the time this all rolled up? Was, he references it. I mean, it was honestly. I mean, I think that's always on his mind. To be clear. So it's never far away from the conversation. But having said that, no, the, the interview took place a little bit before that moment in time. So, uh, you know, but I, I would say, by the way, you know, the, the whole love riot thing that he does, you know, which is his manifestation of the jazz. You know, I just think that's I, that's so awesome. It, it, it truly it truly is in terms of the connection that that fosters for people who aren't aware of that, haven't seen it in action or haven't participated. You can find some online and they're they're pretty darn great. Is what I would say. Um, all right, I'll continue on. Yeah, keep going, it, keep going. Right. We can talk, we'll, we'll, do a, we'll do a little bit about each of these people. Let's see what else you got. Well, I, here's the, the good old Grateful Dead you mentioned earlier. Mr. Mickey Hart talks about uh, the nature of improvisation and um, how that continues to inspire him. And some of, because, you know, he does, I'm sure, as you know, Jeff, he does a lot of work, some work on this, some of the physiological implication of that in the brain waves and how all that's come together and some of the research that's going on today and that's some of what he explores in his kind you know my conversation with him in here and i think that's really really cool because i don't think enough can be can be said about that i really do think and, and you, you know, when's the last time you saw a live show Jeff? i saw tame impala at the forum on uh nice. march 10th 
by Greenhouse, by the way. I wrote our last cover, wrote our cover story on them two issues ago. People should should check that out. But but the point being that like when you don't see live music, aside from the psychological part of it, I really do believe that there's a physiological element. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, because music can put you in a trance state. Music, music can put you in touch with yourself. I mean, it's amazing. We've all had those experiences on, on and off drugs where we've had transcendental moments on music. So we all understand the power of music, uh, but the power of live, which is what your issue about, is really what we're missing now. So how do we fill the void? Mike Greenhouse, what do you say? I mean, I think there's... I think one of the things that this cover story really uh, and this issue in general really showed me is that there's not just one way. I mean, everyone has a different way that they could feel the power of life. For some people, doing a webcast or some sort of um, uh, Zoom conversation performance thing really does capture that. For some people, it's looking back in the archives and being with your friends, either virtually or in a, in a room in a social distance situation, being able to kind of experience that together. Uh, I mean, I haven't been to one yet, quite yet, although I did go to one in the, in the 90s, which I uh, was thinking finally about, but the, you know, the, the drive-in concerts are something that I think is a really interesting way to kind of have that live experience. Um, but you know, for, for right now, I think that while live music is on a, a kind of perm or a semi-permanent set break, um, it's just, having that connection to the people that you would be in a live environment with. Um, a lot of the interviews that I did for this issue and for the upcoming issue, just talking to musicians, it just felt so good to connect and hear what they're doing, whether it's just mundane things like, you know, staying at home and using this time to redo their kitchen or you know, listen to them kind of create music or just having conversations like this, where we reminisce about some of the, the awesome times we all had together because you know the power of live is something that is shared um, with the people around you as well as the people you're listening to, of course. Yeah, well, a, a lot of these older uh, jam bands that we're all fans of have young families too. And they're yeah. finding that they're spending a lot more time, quality time at home and understanding what they're not, what they're missing when they're not there. And it's been a big revelation on what the, how the family dynamic is. And people are coming to a new understanding of what it means to be on the road, yeah. I think. Because people have never really spent this much time at home. Everybody I talk to, nobody spent a hundred days. It's been a hundred and it's been like hundred and five days since they started yeah. uh, lockdown on March thirteenth, uh, I think, something like that. So that uh, people have not been like everybody I talk to. I talked to Jeff Gordon, the promoter for Live Nation in Philadelphia. He said it, the last time something like this happened was probably uh, thirty years ago in his life where it was a hundred days with, with no music. I mean, yeah. it, it's crazy. We're all missing. There's a huge hole where this used to go, but I will say this, my bank account, it's, it's, uh, it's appreciating the break. <laughs> <laughs> and, every, and everyone, and everyone whose bank accounts are doing, you know, uh, are appreciating the break too, could, you know, pony up those $25 and subscribe to relics right now. Because, yes. You know, you know, those that would have been one nice cocktail at a New York bar. <laughs> and and how many issues is does that? How many issues you guys do in a year? That's eight issues. Eight issues. And uh, are you still doing the CD? Yep, each issue has a CD. Why? <laughs> cool. I don't even have a CD. I don't even have a CD player anymore. I don't even have a CD player. What, what am I doing? Do they make good frisbees? I will yeah. say. Why? Why haven't you? Because it, it costs more money to print with the CD, obviously. And the technology has changed to the point where everybody goes on to, to Spotify for a playlist nowadays. Why continue with the CD when the technologies and when, when our whole world has changed so much? Because to me, it's old technology that I don't really use anymore ever. Do you guys listen to CDs? I mean, really? I actually do. You so do? I actually, I actually do. If we were in my office, I'd show you my wall, which is, yeah. I, you know. But, but when you're when you're driving around in the car, it's Spotify or it's phone. I mean, you know, when you're at home, when you're just in there with a Bluetooth speaker, you're just popping it on. I mean, the convenience of having your music accessible on your phone nowadays has changed everything and changed technology. And I and my daughter is a huge environmentalist, and the, you, the amount of plastic that you use to create that is a lot of waste. So my vote is that you guys need to get rid of the CD and maybe do a playlist and save and, and we just have, save we, have, we have we have a we have a digital sampler as well as uh, everything that's on the CD is also uh, on a Spotify playlist so we were we're checking all those boxes okay yeah and then you know what Jeff man it's charming come on yeah it's charming
Yeah. Well, yeah, so so was uh so was eight track tapes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, am, well, I, got an, I don't know what to do with those either. <laughs> Speaking the way of things which, are going, maybe we'll have an A-track player in the next issue. <laughs> We're hoping. Um, yeah, do you remember the, the first time that you and I worked together? Right. Do, do yeah. you remember when this was? Go ahead. It was in 2002. No, it was 2003. Sorry. At the, uh, at the IT Festival. Because we do the newspaper, right? right, now, right. Same idea yeah. about a newspaper, but a newspaper is freaking charming. And I go out, you know, I go out to my driveway like Tony Soprano every day, and I get my newspapers. I get my New York, my New York Times well, when it shows you know, up. Yeah. Okay, so so now, Dean, you're walking right into the fucking mousetrap. I just want you to know because personally, how many people read magazines nowadays? I gotta say, during this whole uh, pandemic. I would say that I probably read more magazines and more physical newspapers than I have in, in you know, in a long time. And I, I actively, obviously, you know, being uh, an editor of a, of a print magazine, I read it all the time anyway. But, you know, people are at, or for most of this have been at home. So having something come to you in the mail is nice. It's kind of, it feels comforting to get something from. I, I, well, I love having the relics. It's good bathroom reading yeah. material because you are, yeah. are nice. A absolutely. Cool. You know, I, I feel that uh, we're, I'm always very proud when I'm at a friend's house and I see it on the toilet. It makes me feel <laughs> like, you know, I've uh, accomplished something in my life. <laughs> And I think there's other magazines in general. So I'm sitting around, you know, trying not to be online quite as much when I don't have to be. Obviously, you know, we're doing a lot of work, whether it's uh, interviews or or meetings in the office or, or catching up with friends on Zoom calls uh, on our phones and on our on our computers. So it's kind of nice to pick up something and uh, and read um, in a, in a different medium in a different way that way. Good. Yeah, man. Plus, Jeff, come on, the, the, the tactile sensation. I really do believe that. I, that's I read books too. I enjoy, you know. I, there's something to be said for turning a page. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just telling you, like looking at, because I have, I have kids in their twenties, and I see what their habits are, and I know what my habits are, and the amount of magazines I pick up. I might read the the, the Costco uh, magazine when it comes to the mail <laughs> to see what the specials are. But I really don't, I don't find myself reading magazines, and I definitely don't read books anymore. Uh, every everything I read is on the computer. I don't want to really own anything anymore because I don't want to create a, a footprint so like i don't go to to look to look to buy physical things maybe once in a while i'll see a picture i bought the jim marshall book i thought was really well done i see a book i like i'll buy it but i, I just don't find myself consuming information like that and i find the way that i get information now everything's online i saw that tray interview today and i sucked it down and that's the way i want it right there well, it's the best of all world. You yet can. I mean, we obviously we put these online. You go to relics.com slash support, pick up a subscription, by the way, yeah. anybody who's who's still moved out there. Um, I, I don't know. I think we offer I think we offer both the same way that you can read a book on a Kindle or you can read a book if you want to have it physically in front of you. I don't know. I don't see why we necessarily have to privilege one or the other. And no, well, you can I, recycle, I you can recycle I see the economic change and what's changing on, on that level. And the scale is like, I talked to Mike when we first, when we started before you, you chimed in and there was an article about how two major newspaper chains are probably going to be out of the for profit um, newspaper business that they're going to have to do everything as a nonprofit because that whole business has changed. We've seen what's happened in newspapers, something I used to read every day and news changes so fast nowadays. You guys are giving us a product that is worth having in our collection. So it's it's a piece of history that you know, you're know you going to want to refer to. I mean, my relics are something I go back and look through to, to read different articles throughout the years, but it's also everything has changed so much. So I got you, Dean, but we're both also old men and we are, we have old ways and the, the ways of the youth are not the same anymore. And the way information, look, I'm looking at a career I had for the past three decades that I kind of think is finished. And I'm talking about photography and large vent, large scale photography is kind of finished right now. I don't know if it's going to come back. I don't think it's going to come back in a year. Somebody was saying today that Cuomo okayed the MTV Video Music Awards to happen in New York City on Labor Day. And I just don't see how a reality you have uh, an ability to have an event where people are going to want to come or that you, you can't have an audience. You the, the talent's not going to want to walk. There's not going to be a red carpet. So what's the event? And then again, I was thinking, how relevant is MTV in 2020? Who gives a shit? Because MTV's overstayed their welcome and haven't figured out how to work in a new paradigm too. So they're ancient now and they're trying to stay relevant and they don't even have a place anymore. Anyway, I'm definitely ranting, but I definitely have feeling the pain of what's been happening throughout this whole transference and also with the change of 
the, the industries, communication being one of them. I still think we're going to come out the other side, though, like circa Spanish flu 1918. And eventually we'll all make adjustments and shows will start up again and big events, I think, you know, will start up again. Maybe the NBA is going to start up in next month. We'll see. Maybe okay. Major League Baseball. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Every, yeah, every, maybe. Time, every time they dig in, they start testing everybody and they're like, oh, guess what? We got guys that are sick. I, uh, right. So but I do think it's going to happen. I, you know, I, I do. I believe that. Honestly, if, if anything made me long for the days where you, you know, waited a day to get your newspaper and get your news, it's it's some of the events like we are hearing right now. Like, you know, I, I obviously check in with Cuomo's uh, daily briefings on the, on the regular. And, you know, things have changed four times since the first news story went up at 11 a.m. You know, like bars are open. No, they're closed. No, they're going to be open only outside. Maybe we're not sure. No, Jersey is closing. It's, you know, I wish that it was almost like there was a little bit of like a a moment for people to be able to kind of like formulate a plan and report on it and then actually learn the information. In well, that day, Mike, you know? that's because of the vacuum yeah. at the top, my man. Yeah. That's yeah. because there's a vacuum at the top. If there was leadership from the top on down, then we would be unified. But one of the things I'm reading about is not only the United States, but our whole world and the way it's opening because we're not cohesively on the same page together. There's going to be issues. So I hate to say it. Trey was talking about, uh, he was hoping there's not five years off, but and, you know, I saw Alec, uh, did you see Alec Baldwin's rant today on, uh, he did, it was an epic rant about how he's moved outside the city and he, how he wants to go back to the city, but he's got young kids and it's not good in the city. It's just very interesting. And his thing was, what happens if we're not back till 2021 or 2022, where we're, this is the new norm and, and we're going to keep inching back in and inching back out. So it's just, we're in a very interesting time now and yeah. everybody's trying to figure it out and no, and we don't have the leadership to, to guide us through this. And that's why we're going to have issues. I hear that's right. President Cuomo, you know. <laughs> when, you, when you talk about, uh, when you're talking about new norm, I want getting back to this. Yes. Our, our next in order, as we're going through, and it's relevant, is Warren Haynes. And what Warren Haynes says, that he's, I ref, he says it in the piece, you know, I refuse to call this the new normal because it's not, the, it's not normal. There's nothing normal about it. And I have a lot of respect for his unwillingness unwillingness to accept what's happening right now as in any way shape or form being reflective of what we should be willing to accept within within you know culture and society today remains to be seen do you see his essay in uh in uh, newsweek by the way really really powerful on, no what did it say uh, he was just talking about it was about race and you know where where we're at where we're going and i think he has a real has a unique perspective the allman brothers band obviously going way back the band that he came on into with the tradition coming out of Florida of being, you know, uh, having uh, a lot of different people of, of rep representing the uh, the country in a more, I think, honest way, more in and how they sort of had to deal with things over the years by having, you know, JMO in the band and some of the issues that he had to go through over time. I just think it's an, it's an interesting piece that people should check out if they haven't had a chance to yet. Well, especially from a bunch of Southern guys that weren't no uh, any strangers to the Confederate flag or <laughs> any of that kind of yeah. uh, of uh, imagery, because that was what they grew up with. Right. Yeah. And you know, I, I think that, but by the same token, right, he grew up in in Asheville himself, right, which is a, which especially lately has a much, and I think always because there's always been sort of that artsy side to it, but I think really comes out of a more liberal tradition and, and sort of pushing back against a lot of what's going on within that sort of Confederate culture. It's, it's interesting. And I think he has a just a fascinating take on all this. Well, I, I don't think there's a new normal, but I think there's going to be, I don't think there's any normal to go back to. I don't think, it, I think it's going to be a long stretch before there's, until we're back to travel. Like I read a thing about travel today, another article saying that travel's probably never going to get back to where it was before this all happened. The amount of way we were all flying and winging everywhere at the drop of a hat, you know? Uh, me, my, myself included. I mean, I, I, I love travel. It's, it's what's fueled me for the past two decades, three decades, just going around the world and shooting and these all these amazing events. And it's, uh, it's, uh, I, there's going to be a, a new normal because we're not going to go back to, we're not going back to anything. There's no, there's not going to be like, okay, we're back. You know, I think it's, everybody's going to have these slow little up to, like I said, four steps forward, two steps back, yeah. two more steps back. You know, back and forth. Who's after Warren? Hey, by the way, before that, though, go ahead. Uh, 
you know, I think you should take a day off and just like read a read a novel. Like we're in the 19th century now. I'm serious about that, man. I, I'm totally serious about that. You know what I mean? Like, oh. yeah, I think it's real easy to get caught up in your phone, get caught up in your screen and like all the news that that's coming. And I'm not saying I'm not guilty of it, but I think sometimes sit outside and uh and read you know read a book, you know. I, I not that you don't necessarily, but just <laughs> away from I just think there's like an onslaught of all of that negative energy coming at coming at people. Not that you should put your head in a hole. Well, you, you, hey, well like, listen, Dean, yeah. put it this way. I'm trying to figure out what my what my paradigm shift, what my pandemic shift is at, uh, career-wise because I realize that there's probably going to be another 18 months before there are the award shows and the events coming back at the level they were. Until there's a vaccine, until there's a way that people feel comfortable in large spaces. So... I get that. I'm just saying, like, you know, I don't know, read read some uh Hey, you know, I, listen, I sit there playing my guitar and putting on the dead or whatever it is for like hours. <laughs> Am I frozen? I can't I can't quibble about that. Yeah, I, I mean that's why I say I, I use music as my escape and I also read a lot, but I, I I'll go slip out for hours where I'm just jamming along with whatever's happening and just like in that space. And I find music helps me get into that other side of my brain. So, yeah, you know, listen, I, I, I'm not saying you should. I'm not saying I'm not accusing you of not reading. I'm just saying step away from my music. Yes, music you are, though. Dean. Come yes, on. I'm, I'm, a terrible, <laughs> I'm a terrible man. Um, no, I so music is the answer. Like, that's cool. That's even, you know, that's great. But sometimes I think it's it's essential. I, I've had this conversation with members of my my family and just said, listen, we got to, we have to, we have to step away for a little oh, bit. Well, trust me, I, I don't watch the, I try to tune off. A little bits of news and just trying to like make sure you get the information. Well, I guess the most guilty thing is the Twitter because uh, you just watch that feed and it just blows yeah. you away with the way the information's flying and how fast it comes and how fast there's a response. And it's just like, it's like watching a, a, a train wreck. <laughs> well, it is when you're looking at uh, the, the Twitter feed coming from uh, our, oh, you know, well, it, 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 Listen, it's not just him. It's all the stuff. I'll tell you what's impressive is the stuff coming out of the Lincoln Project. They are just hammering every day with a new video. I mean, these people are smart. They're going to they're gonna hit him on the, where it hurts. Yeah. And he can't he can't take it. He's such a he cannot take it. Well, and, and, and also, oh, I don't know if you were watching Supreme Court today, but a huge blow to the, all these people trying to get rid of the abortion clinics in Louisiana today happened. And that was like the yeah. third or fourth vote in a row out of the Supreme Court that were a direct blow across Trump, uh, our president's. Uh, yeah. OK, yeah. by the way, can we can we stick with that for a second? Let's talk about yeah. let's talk about Susan Collins and how she toadied up to Brett Kavanaugh and said, oh, yeah, Brett Kavanaugh, he's definitely going to respect precedent. Well, he certainly tried to not respect precedent today. And yeah. I think people have to be aware of that. Listen, yeah. I don't think people should be too caught up in, in like, honestly, Twitter maybe too, too much. But I do think you should be aware of, of, of current events. And to not be aware of what's going on now, how you know, Brett Kavanaugh either snookered Susan Collins or Susan, uh, Susan Collins was complicit in what he said and was just hiding you know, just laying low, hiding under the radar and making that vote and saying, don't worry, everybody. Well, I think, you know, I think everybody's making it. excuses for everybody and everybody's covering everybody's ass from what they were trying, at least. And unapologetically, too. It's it, it's very it's very scary. Thank God we have relics to keep us <laughs> off of out, off of the news. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So keep it moving forward. Go uh, ahead. I'm yeah, with you. Uh, Jason Isbell. Um, who, you know, speaking of fearless leaders, our own fearless leader, Mr. Shapiro, who has been on this lovely program. Yeah, I watched that. Um, you know, he owns he had, had to delay the opening of Brooklyn Bowl Nashville. Although I believe you can go there now and have a have a beverage and, and, something and, fri and fried chicken, I think. Yeah. And fried chicken. And bowl. Um, and bowl. And bowl. Right. And bowl. Yeah. Uh, but so he has. So Jason Isbell, right, came down there, performed a show, uh, you know. That was, that, was first, that was the first show, right? Yeah. First show. And so he talks a little bit about that, the decision to do that, why he decided, why he and Amanda decided to perform there. And that's sort of, I think, another side of what like the power of live is, what it can be. Uh, you know, honestly, that prompted the question to Trey about, you know, would you do it? And he said it wasn't for him necessarily. But I think it's cool to, to hear, you know, Jason. Yeah, what, what was Jason's take on it? Just give us a synopsis. You don't have to give us the whole article because you want to you want to keep us something to, to well, I think read. I think I think Jason uh rightfully said that you know in a in a 
if he was at a different stage in his career, he probably would have delayed releasing this album to when he could tour, what, you know, whenever that is. But he's in a fortunate position that he's built a really loyal fan base and people were really excited for this album. He actually released it uh, through independent record stores before his release uh, online. Speaking of our, uh, our physical medium, a conversation a few moments ago. And I think he wanted to you know, celebrate the album coming out, play these songs live. Uh, he's also lucky that you know he's married to one of his bandmates, so they could actually interpret this and still do a safe social distance show. And he, you know, he's uh, he lives in the area. He could come down, he could play a great show. And uh, you know, the, we're also fortunate that the bowl is set up in a way that they could do a really high quality webcast where people could zoom in and feel like they're part of the conversation in a in a really organic way. Yeah. He also said, by the way, he didn't want to wait, like because right. he feels like the, the the music came out of the moment. And so since he could release it, since he's been you know done okay over the past few years, he doesn't he's not necessarily entirely reliant on 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 sales of his of his recorded music that he thought he sort of had the luxury where he could be part of the conversation, maybe uh, give people uh, make them feel a little bit more comfortable during this time. And at any rate, he just he, the songs were fresh and he wanted to he wanted to share them, which I think is I think is pretty. Well, I, I would think that the, the like if you look at Lady Gaga, who had a project coming out in the middle of March, and she totally sat on because she couldn't tour with it and everything else. By the time that comes out, it's going to be like, who cares? I mean, you, you should be releasing music all the time because by by the time that's ready to come out, she's probably going to have a whole other record out that she's not even going to care about the one she did in March because, like Trey, oh, you're going to have all these songs that are more meaningful and more in the in the moment. Yeah. So uh, that's interesting. Jason's an amazing talent. What a great guitar player. All right, and a, great, and a great songwriter, an exceptionally literate individual, like yeah. a literate songwriter, like a songwriter's yeah. songwriter. People who have not had a chance, I'm sure most everyone who's here, who's who who is here with us today, has uh, has seen him do his thing. But if for some reason you haven't, it's he's well worth yeah. checking out. His songwriting is incredible. I was watching him. I was actually watching his lock-in performance. I went back to watch the lock-ins. Uh, this week on the side because it's hard to sit through everything right when you, it's yeah. all day right and i went back and i watched his performance and he's he just uh amazing songwriting and a talented guy town of bands town of family and by the way unlocking a lovely a lovely a lovely weekend's music uh yeah. take it back to lock in, huh? yeah. that? that was uh, yes it was really good it was really well done and so far pete's the only one that's still got uh Something going on, a festival on the books because Bonnaroo pulled out this week and uh, Outside Lands pulled out or actually last week. So the only, th the only thing possible is lock-in and um, we're going to have to see how that goes with the way it's going. I'm sure he's got his fingers and toes crossed <laughs> for that. And, and by the way, beyond, uh, beyond Jason, right, he just had Larkin Poe. I mean, he's having music come right. through uh, – Come through the come through Bull Nashville, which I think is pretty is pretty cool. Uh, uh, Billy Strings coming yep. up a little later a little later in July. I mean, he's doing what he you know what he what he can down there with with what he has, you know. Okay, taking a little Nashville lemonade. Uh, Don was the the president of Luno. <laughs> yeah, and a member of Bobby Weir's band too, as it turns out. So yeah. and a pretty incredible guy. He sort of talks about his take. I think he sort of walks that fine line because he is a working musician has been for 35, 40 years. And he's a label head and takes that pretty seriously. And he, yeah. he's a cool guy. I, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big en enthusiast. And for people who, you know, maybe you know a little bit about him or not, but to, to hear him talking about what he does at Blue Note, you can, people can go online and check out his, uh, his conversation at the Relics Live Music Conference uh, from the year before, I guess, it was last, I guess it was last year at this point. Um, and I thought that was that was one of my favorite moments from the uh, from the festival, so, uh, from the live music conference, rather, for people who want to check that out. Uh, all right, moving along. Go ahead. We have uh, Robert Mercurio, bass player from uh, the lovely Galactic, who is also the owner of Tipitinas. <laughs> right. Uh, yep. People who don't know that, you know, Galactic bought Tipitinas because they sort of felt like they needed to. They were going to sort of be the try to shepherd it along at a time where, you know, Tipitina's needed to keep, to keep going. And so he sort of talks about his perspective, number one, obviously as a touring musician, but number two, what's it like all of a sudden to be a venue owner, which I thought was really, really fascinating because he said, yeah. you know, they go out on the road after they took it over and they had no idea. All of a sudden they're looking at all, around all the different rooms, thinking about what they can add. The tips. And uh, I don't know. I, I know that it's a challenge. People can go to the Tipitina's Facebook page 
and get a sense of some of the challenges they're getting through and how they're trying to connect with other independent venue owners and try to fight the good fight during this yep. particular we're, moment. We're, we're, we're about to lose the Troubadour here, which is a historical venue where the yeah. owner actually owns the building and he still can't afford to stay in business. So yeah. there, there's a lot of small venues. Uh, the Boom Boom Room in San Francisco has been doing a lot of fundraisers. It's like one venue after another is up against the ropes. And these are the people that bring us the enjoyment. But, you know, the longer we stay closed, the harder it's going to be for these places to come back. And uh, it, it's really, really hard. So, okay. Oh, uh, oh. your list. <laughs> I, I realize, no, by the way, you can yeah. pick, pick this up. Uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, Bonnie Raitt, who has been at it. For, the, thing I, the, thing about, the thing that I thought was really cool about, about Bonnie is that over the course of her, going back to the outset of her career, she always supported a lot of other artists, artists that she had once opened for, people like Sippy Wallace, um, uh, you know, people who were important to her as a music fan. And then she turned that around and helped out them. And so I was thinking a little bit about the Jazz Foundation of America and the benefit that they did and how they support a lot of artists who, particularly jazz artists, uh, older jazz artists who can't necessarily go out and find gigs. And maybe it's a little dangerous for them to be playing gigs. And so I, I just thought, I, again, just respecting what they do, I wanted to hear her take on 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 some of that as well as just, you know, her experience playing live. Live is really, really, as she says in the piece, is really, really important to her. And she, I mean, she owes her whole career to being able to, to you know, to tear it up in, in the live setting, which she's been doing for a while and she's quite good at it. So, yeah. um, well, she's, awesome. she's a legend and she's got a lot of history. So, yeah. And you know what? And she's, and she's socially aware and active, which I thought was pretty cool in this moment as well to hear what she had to say about, about, you know, some of the, what we can do to sort of push back and try to fight the good fight at this moment in time, even though to be, to be clear, right, as we said, the interview took place before some of, some of what's been going on more recently, but still, you know, you can't speak with her and not have her be, have a very sort of empathetic take on what's going on and really want to legitimately push for some larger social change within, within the United States and the globe. And so that's, well, that's it's really not like what's going on is new. It's just that it's all being forced at the top, the top yeah. right? Stuff we've been, same shit we've been going through for years. But everything's coming out to the open now. And we have the time and the lack of distractions where people are focusing on the causes, which is interesting. So, okay, Bonnie, keep going. Oh, and then we're done. We're, and, then, and then we finish. Can I, can I see? Oh, uh, with uh, Carlos Santana. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so, you know, Carlos, again, you know what he he's gonna he talks about the energy of live because that's what he really believes in and that connection with the audience and then Trey in the Trey interview Trey I had Trey respond a little bit to some of what Carlos had to say because obviously they have that relationship going back going back in the day you know when yeah. Carlos had fish open at ninety two tour and I don't know if you were there do either I was there I was there up in Stowe when uh, when Carlos came out with them when they were the open when they, you know when they were opening for him. That was just amazing. You know, that was just the idea that he would show them that respect in their home state because he just was such a fan of what they were doing. It's a pretty, it's a pretty amazing moment, and still ripping. If a lot of people want to go check check that out, um, I think off the top of my head, I could be wrong. I think that's seven twenty five ninety two, but somebody could correct me. But I'm almost positive that that's what it is up at the Stowe Performing Arts Center in in, in Stowe, Vermont. So anyhow. Carlos talks a little bit about about the power of live, really kind of for a, from a spiritual standpoint. And, uh, and all that, by the way, is just a cover story. There's so much more. Mike, you want to talk about something else from the issue? that? No, I mean, I, I mean, I think the power of live theme kind of trickled to, to everything throughout the entire issue. We have a, an awesome uh, Steve Malkmus uh, interview uh, by the great Benji Eisen, where he talks about um, kind of his, his kind of more folk and groove oriented albums he's been working on, as well as the uh, pavement reunion, which was going to happen this summer and is now who knows when will happen, uh, at least in front of a live setting. Uh, I talked to Ed O'Brien of Radiohead about, uh, you know, his new solo project as well as Fish. And we had Mike Gordon kind of respond to, to him and their experiences meeting backstage in Vegas a few years ago. Um, yes, well, well, it, it, Ed's an interesting story because he was inspired by the open ended jamness of the yeah. Fish music, which Radiohead really isn't a uh, jam band, so to speak but they're intriguing and I've seen them stretch things out a little bit, maybe an extra 30 seconds here or there, but they're not really like extensive. So it's interesting to see how Ed infiltrates it. And when I, I listened to his record, did you get, I didn't get a lot of that off of it. 
when I'd heard his record. I mean, I think, you know, it was, I think it was actually, uh, Mike Gordon actually says this in, uh, in his, he was like a secondary source interview for the, for the piece. And he was talking about the, the trance element of Radiohead, which is in how they kind of layer things. And though it's not stretched out in an improvisational way, there's that, there's that, that flow and that energy. And I think that that's the element that Ed has on his album, um, which was also, you know, inspired by his, uh, his world travels, his time living in South America. I think that was more of a direct inspiration. Right. Um, but I think, it, I think for him, it was more, um, the way he sees music as well as how he put together his, his new solo band, which incorporates, uh, some new Orleans elements as well as, um, you know, some of his, his friends from the UK. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, going back to that 2006 Bonnaroo show, uh, what radio had played, which is still one of their, uh, defining moments and favorite live shows ever. I think for him, um, seeing that energy is something that's kind of kept him going as a musician, even if maybe it hasn't inspired him to, you know, take his songs from four minutes to eight minutes to or 20 minutes or whatever. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of the power of live, I, Jeff, I, you had, I know you were, you had to have been there, but that first, that first performance at Bonnaroo by, uh, by Radiohead in 06. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I remember walking out from somewhere side stage, walking out into the, into the crowd, maybe like, Five minutes into the thing and ev the whole audience everyone was so quiet and so with that yeah. i've never it, it's one of my it's one of my top certainly my top 50 uh, live performances that i've been to experiences in my in my life you know there's a fair share of grateful dead and so forth in there but it, it definitely it, it certainly makes the list I, I i can't remember certainly at bonnaroo i don't know if i can remember like, like experiencing a show ever like that not that there haven't been other Shows like that. Well, well, it, well, that was the show where it really opened it up to having different music at Bonnaroo besides the jams. Was Radiohead came the way they were accepted, led right in the 2007 where we got Tool, which really blew the lid off. In 2008, when they gave us Metallica, the if you look at those three years, those were the years that kind of okay, anything flies. Kanye was in that time also. You know that. Hey, <laughs> were, were you at that? Were you at that? Set? Were you at that set? I was at that. Set. <laughs> the Kanye set where he couldn't, he wouldn't start, and then people were throwing bottles. And he was a little disrespect. I don't know. That was a weird. That, that was that was a weird. Uh, no disrespect to Kanye. That that first time when he was there was an was an odd. Uh, an you odd, know, I still odd. see fuck Kanye signs on the on the walls of Bonnaroo when I'm riding around in a golf cart. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I, he all I'm saying is he could have handled it a little bit differently. He could have been a hero in the end instead of making people wait out there till the sun came up, which well, is what happened. Let, let's really just really 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 performance. E ego, me, ego maniacs and jam yeah. don't go together. Yeah. You can't, it, you got to be true to your soul and true to yourself to be able to, to resonate with that audience. And that's why Kanye's never been successful at Bonnaroo because, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, and, and I think, you know, Ed talks about this uh, a good amount in the piece too is that. You know, it wasn't only um, the fact that it opened up what type of bands we booked at Bonnaroo, but it, it was just realizing that bands respond differently to playing to that audience. You, you know, they had, uh, they were given a, a longer set time than Radiohead had, had, so they had a chance to kind of change the set list up and stretch things out. The fact that they were at a field with people who were, were there to see them, but also there to see Phil Lesh or Tom Petty or whomever else was, was on the bill that year, made them rethink how they were presenting their music. And I think that, you know, Kanye did not get that at all. He's like, no, these are my, you know, people are coming to see me and me only, even though he wasn't even one of the uh, the top three headliners. That no, nobody, yeah. I, I don't know no anybody one. for Kanye. I mean, come yeah. on. Let's face it. We were going to Bonnaroo for completely different reasons. Yeah. I think we lost Dean. Let's see. It's the power, it's the power of live. Here he is. He's back. <laughs> no, he's gone. Yeah. He's gonna kill. He'll call back in. But um, um, that's the power of live. Let me tell you, I've been yeah. feeling it. Yeah, one fuck up after another. Every time I go on the air, it's like, oh, what did I do wrong now? Oh, Jesus! I, I was, I'm, I'm particularly sad about Bonnaroo this year because you know I, I felt the headliners were were such a nice mixture of the festival's evolution and kind of where um, you know music is currently in, in the pop world, whether it's Lizzo or, or Tame or Vampire Weekend and, and people like that. Yeah, oh, it definitely was a reflection of where we are, and it was a very diverse lineup. Which Bonnaroo has always been. It's crazy. Yeah. crosses all the genres, and you know it, it's probably the biggest hole I have right now. The the lack of fish, the lack of even Dead and Company. I'd go for a good Dead and Company show. I'd go for yeah. anything right now. I'm kind of uh, desperate. Are you feeling the hole? 
I'm definitely feeling the whole, I, I have been lucky to, I've seen a few uh, socially distant shows down here in South Carolina while I've been uh, quarantined here because some things are opened up in, in large uh, kind of spaced out places. So I have seen a, a few shows and I feel very lucky to, uh, to do that. And I really do feel the power of live and just experiencing something with other people in a, in a live outdoor setting is, is something, there's something really, uh, really just, you know, um, powerful of it really you well, know, you know you, the real thing I, you realize like if you look over my shoulder there yeah. is how much how much we took that for granted yeah how much you would walk out on the field out of outside lands and be like ah another august in san francisco with exactly yeah thousand people no i mean miss especially like you know bonnero much like you you know i've been there since 2002 and missing it this year was like is it new year's eve or thanksgiving or something was canceled all of a sudden it's like but that's all happening too don't worry yeah yeah <laughs> it's all um, going on um so mike what do you want to tell the people out there i mean what, what's happening you, you people really you need people to step up right yeah well you know basically you know so the june issue traditionally going back uh 20 years actually has been our festival issue and it's always our big signature issue and it's an issue where we try to um both tune people on to new up-and-coming bands like that's i think the first time we had Mumford and Sons on the cover years ago, Dawes, a lot of bands who have, have since grown with the magazine. Uh, and it's also a time when we kind of just take a, the pulse of where live music is, whether it's talking about who is playing which festivals or who has big summer tours or who is kind of um, doing something really special over the summer. And we try to just refocus that energy into this, this power of live uh, issue because that, as you said, Jeff, that's what we're all missing. We're all missing that connection. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, in a, in a nuts and bolts way, we really could use the support more than we have in a long time. So if anyone uh, has a $25 that they would have used for and a drink or a concert ticket easy, or whatever, you know, you a nice easy gift to give also, right? An easy gift to give. A it's an easy gift to give. Um, you could renew your subscription. As you mentioned, a lot of people are uh, are using this opportunity to, to move either temporarily or permanently. So uh, feel free to uh, also use it as a time to change your address and uh, sign up for another year. Uh, we have Krongbin in our next cover, uh, which is our July, August issue, which we'll be putting the bed in a, in a few weeks. Uh, they have a great new album, which came out last week. And, um, you know, we have some other uh, exciting things coming down the line. Well, people are uh, at home and um, a little bit more stationary during the summer months. We're hoping to catch up with some people that um, maybe usually really don't have an opportunity to during the summer. Well, great. Well, we look forward to tuning in. I encourage everybody out there to go to relics.com support and uh, give the boys some love and the, the, the girls at yeah. Relics. And, uh, and next year, hopefully we'll see you in the field with the Relics booth, which we missed too. I mean, it's, it's actually always really nice to catch up with people. I literally have, you know, either old friends who I, I only get to see when we bump into each other at festivals or just random people that, you know, we, we hear about new bands that way. We hear about uh, what we could do better that way. We hear about all sorts of great stuff. So well, let's face it, we'll, 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 we'll be catching up for 20 years every year yeah. at Bonnaroo in June. And it's Absolutely, kind of like yeah. the big, the big leveling experience up oh, Dean. He's back. Power, didn't you? I did. You know, I was. I've been outside working for a while, so <laughs> I've okay. done it. It's the worst. Uh, well, Mike was just wrapping up. Is there anything you want to say? You're just in time to say goodbye and wrap up. I'm good. Well, look, these are my books, Jeff. We can read. We can read books. books are great. <laughs> you know. Good hey, listen, if, if the heat, if you ever lose heat, you got. You, got, you know, you guys will be warm well, for a couple nights. But if I lose, if you lose power. I can pick some, you know, right? If I lose power, I can, I can pick amazing. Dean, I you still know? have all your books. Don't worry. I still have all your books, Dean. Thank you. Um, no, just uh, relics.com support. Is that, that's it, right? Yes. Yeah. Other we, than that, I'm good, man. Wait, wait, you that, know what, Dean, I have a couple minutes. I have a couple minutes. There's one thing I want to ask you about, and, and we were just talking about Bonnaroo, Mike and I. You've been the editor of the Bonnaroo Beacon for, since they started it, right? I started it. I yeah, started it. Was that 2000 and what? Two. 2002, the first year. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, the first year, I wrote all. I wrote it. I was a photographer back before I had your help. Yeah. I, I, I wrote it. I was the photographer. I was the editor. And I designed it. I got someone to teach me how to do page maker. And so the, I, I basically was like three all-nighters. And then I crashed the last day, missed my deadline, drove to the little, um, the little printer, in downtown Manchester, and they they saw me driving up. They had already left. I was so late because I just crashed, and they came back and they saved me. I mean, that's I I love those people. 
uh, Total Graphics. They just shut down because of the uh, because of coronavirus. They're they're you know, and they decided to retire uh, after doing it. But they published every single year of the of the Bonnaroo Beacon. But yeah, it got easier over over time. I didn't have to after the first year. I didn't have to design it in PageMaker. You know, a couple of years in, I got you to help me on the photo side, and then the photos looked a hell of a lot better. So that was cool. Yeah. You know. But it's been fun. I mean, I really love that project. Same thing with like the fish project that we did where you were the lead photographer, you know, the all about it paper in 2003. Right. I, I, I like doing that. It's so I think it's a real fun challenge and to, to the point where you can do it and then people can hold it in their hot little hands the next day. Like, I love those newspapers. I well, you, they, you know, they were came in incredibly handy. You had the schedule in there. You had any kind yeah. of special things, any kind of messages that the band wanted to get to the fans. It was an opportunity for to tell them what was going on. So. Yeah. We we missed we would like if Mike and I were just licking our wounds over the Bonnaroo and how uh, how much we missed being out there on the farm this year and you know I'm sure you saw the weather because everybody was rubbing it in down there in Nashville it was like 74 degrees <laughs> you know I was just like ah oh. you know next year if they have it's going to be 110 and sticky yeah. so, and then there'll be one day then there'll be one day that'll be like uh, they'll have, to have the thunderstorms and then it'll all smell yeah then once it turns hot the day following that there's always it's been you know, a, a, ma a magical place. And it, uh, tip of the hat to AC, Ashley Caps, and uh, the Superfly guys, you know, for bringing us years of uh, enjoyment out there on the farm. And uh, we'll all be back together enjoying the power of live, hopefully sooner than later. I'm working on a vaccine, guys. So I just nice. want to know. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. He want to invest in it. I'm going to put the Kickstarter up. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Love the relics, love the Pete and everybody out there. Thank you, sir. All, All right. right, guys. Talk to you soon. There you go. Dean Budnick, Mike Greenhouse, Relics Magazine, our friends for years, for decades. You know, Pete Shapiro saved relics. It was about to close. It was done. And he saved it from the from the heap. And, uh, you know, do your thing for uh, our friends there at Relics. Let's talk about uh, Solo Pipe Venice. I was going to send the guys a solo pipe for uh, coming on today. And also our friends, Asher's Chocolate. I know you guys need chocolate out there. I've been cutting through the chocolate. You get the 420 live discount if you use the code, 20% off. Go to Asher's Chocolates. Tell them I sent you. And, uh, you know, pretzels, caramels, you, everything in there is just unbelievably delicious. <sighs> you know, guys, it's not easy out there. It's, it's hard to watch what's going on, but the main thing is to have patience, to breathe, to hydrate, medicate, educate all the Kates. You want to take care and get these wheels going because we are going to single-handedly beat this thing with our own ingenuity because nobody's going to tell us how to do it out there. So you got to take care of yourselves, take care of each other's. Peace, love, happiness to everybody out there. The hug. Oh, I want you all to have a great day. We will see you tomorrow, Tuesday, the 30th of June. 30 days, half September, April, June, and November. So 30 days in the month. We'll see you tomorrow, 420. Same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you all. Thanks to the Relics guys and uh, our good friend, Pete Shapiro.